take our Bibles, please. Psalm number 90. Psalm 90. <clears throat> Psalm 90. And no, Sam Sleeman is not the great nerdly. <laughs> he looks like the great nerdly, but he's not the great nerdly. <clears throat> Psalm 90. <clears throat> Lord, thou hast been our <clears throat> dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man <clears throat> to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men, for a thousand years in thy sight, about as yesterday when it is past. And as a watch in the night, thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as a sleep. In the morning, they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning, it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening, it is cut down and withered. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labour and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants, and thy glory unto their children, and let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. And establish thou the work of our hands upon us, yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. I want to preach to you this morning for a few minutes on, <clears throat> it's about time. It's about time. And let's pray. Thank you, dear Lord, for the beautiful uh, day. Uh, we marvel at your goodness, Father, and your mercies that are new every day. And great is thy faithfulness. Please, Lord, meet with us now. I pray in a special way. I pray and ask for the... A filling of the Spirit of God upon this message, Lord, and please speak to every hearer, uh, whether saved, whether lost, without the Lord, and bless us, we pray, and we'll give you thanks and praise for answering this prayer, in Jesus' name, amen. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday. I want to speak to you this morning on time and it's a very big subject but it's something we often forget about. You know God invented time. God invented time as we know it but he's not constrained by time. 2 Peter 3 verse 8 says, but beloved be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. One Bible commentator puts it this way when comment, commenting on that verse. He said, the Apostle Peter is not giving some prophetic formula here. And we must not use this verse as a key. But the truth is there. A thousand years is with the Lord as a day, and a day is a thousand years. Now, there is a, a, a Bible theory out there that the world has a time span of about 7,000 years, and it sort of makes sense. Um, Usher puts the, uh, uh, the, the date of the creation at 4004 BC, and then we've had about 2,000 years uh, uh, after Christ, so that brings us up to about 6,000 years of world history, add on seven years of tribulation and a thousand years of millennium, that gives you around about seven years. It's a pretty good theory. Um, I'm not going to say that's exactly how long the world is going to go for. <clears throat> but the truth is that with the Lord, who is not constrained by time, a thousand years are as a day, and a day is as a thousand years. 
And I'm sure Peter was referring to this psalm here, Psalm number 90, that the thousand years in God's sight are as a watch in the night. They are just like a sleep, like, like a, a nana nap. <laughs> Who's going to have a nana nap or a, a grandpa nap this afternoon? You know, I can sleep like a log for about 12 minutes and I feel as though I've been asleep all, all night. Honestly, I can. I, and I wake up and my wife's still trying to go to sleep for a, 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 a nana nap. But God is not constrained by time. A thousand years is nothing to God. In fact, the psalmist said that God is from everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God. God has given us this thing called time, and as human beings we are constrained by time. But God is not constrained by time. We do know that time will one day come to an end. Ephesians 1.10 says that in the dispensation in, of the fullness of of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. God has a timetable. And you don't have to look very hard at the world around us to, today to, I, I really think this world is starting to, what's the word, wrap up? We're getting towards the end. We're coming towards the end. Now, will that be this week? I don't know. The Lord could come this week. Will it be in a hundred years' time? I don't know. We're not God. No one knows the day or the hour. But you can see things starting to gather pace. And we live in very exciting times. You know, and as Christians, we, we see what's going around about us, especially in Australia at the moment with this, uh, it's, I just call it a, a spirit of antichrist. The, the hatred of the, of the name Jesus and that shouldn't surprise us because Jesus said, listen, if, if the world hates you, you've got to expect that because they don't actually hate you, they hate me. And if the world hates the Bible and the world hates God's word because it hates Jesus. So we have to expect that. The Bible tells us that God controls time. Psalm 31, 15 says, my times are in thy hand. God controls time time, as in the time of this universe, God controls our lives. When your time is up, your time is up. I remember uh, listening to uh, back in the uh, <clears throat> probably late 70s, early 80s, Ian Paisley came out for a couple of conferences to, to Sydney and I remember hearing him say that uh, uh, he was asked why didn't he have uh, more police protection and bulletproof cars and so on and his answer was something like this he said my time is in God's hand he said up until then I'm invincible <laughs> it's pretty good theology really God controls time we must recognize our time limits we must recognize our time limits the psalmist again said in verse 12, he said, so teach us to number our days. Teach us to number our days. If you take your Bible, keep a bookmark in Psalm number 90, come over to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin that he no longer should live, and look at this little passage here, the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. The Apostle Peter knew that we all have a date. We all have a time limit. The psalmist knew this. He said, number your days. Now, I thought of doing that this morning, but I didn't. Um, but it's not, it's not hard to number your days. The psalmist said there are 70 years appointed unto man and I think with the advances in medicine in Australia in these days, it's, uh, uh, I, think the, I think the average for a, an Australian woman is about 84. Uh, for us blokes, we don't live as long. I don't know why that is, but um, we just don't live as long as ladies, okay? So fellas, we haven't got it quite as good as the ladies, but you know, it's not hard to, uh, if you're... Um, <clears throat> You know, you get to 70, you've done pretty well. I remember my grandpa, um, 
Albert Harper, he got to, uh, when he got to 70, his old house at uh, Gorakin, he had a little, little cardboard card on, on the mantelpiece there, and he said, this is Albert, Albert Harper, he said, I've, I've got to 70 years of age, thank the Lord, and uh, any, any day from now is a, is, a, is a benefit. In case of death, here's my, my daughter's phone number. <laughs> he got to just under 80. That was Grandpa. Some of you here have got past 80. Well, so they say, no one here looks past 80. But some of you have got past 80. And, and you know that is true. Some of you have got past 90. We know people that have got past 100. But once you get past 70, supposedly, I'm not there yet, okay? My grandkids reckon I'm old. My kids reckon I'm old. My grandkids reckon I'm ancient. But I haven't got anywhere near there at the moment. But once you get past the 70, I'm told, life physically it starts to get a bit harder. And then when you get to 80, it most probably gets a bit harder again. The bones creak a bit more. The arthritis kicks in a bit more. But that shouldn't bother us. That shouldn't surprise us because we have a time limit. And we can number our days. Just get a calculator, get your phone and figure it out. There's, uh, what, 365 days in a year? And if just say it's a rough, a rough time, if we live to the average of 80 or thereabouts, you can calculate how many days you've lived and how many days you've got to go. There's a lot of us here. We're in the last quarter. The last quarter. Don't they say that the third quarter is the championship quarter? <laughs> I don't know what, how, to, how to apply that to the Christian life, but a lot of us are in that, that third quarter or, or into the last quarter. Some of us are in extra time. <laughs> We're in overtime. Some are in triple overtime. <laughs> Still going strong. But we must recognise our time limit. And then time is the most precious thing we have. It's the most precious thing we have. It's, uh, James said it's just like a vapour. It's here and it's gone. But time is the most precious thing we have in this world. And many, many illustrations have been made about, I don't know whether they're true or not, about kings and businessmen and, and millionaires and so on saying, all my, all my kingdom for just an extra few seconds of time. But time is the most precious thing we have. Someone uh, said, said it this way. They said, listen, if someone came up to you and uh, a, a benefactor, a wealthy benefactor, and they came up to, uh, <clears throat> to Joss and they said, Joss, I'm going to give you in cash $1,440 every day. Hey, that's pretty cool, eh? But you've got to spend every day cent of that in cash every day you can't keep it you can't save it you have to spend it now, that'd be pretty cool eh? I reckon it would actually get quite difficult to do after a, a few months you can only have so many cameras no you can't have too many cameras you can only have so many cars then the next day I'll give you another $1,440 and you've got to spend every cent you can't save it you can't take it from tomorrow and you can't save yesterday's. You've got to spend it today. That would be quite difficult to do. You know, God gives us 1,440 minutes every day. Every day. It's the most precious thing we have. It's the most precious thing we receive from God is a thing called time. The most precious thing we can give is a thing called time. When you give time to others, that's the most precious thing you can give. How many times have you heard about um, uh, dads especially, we, we, you know, with, with, with our kids or our spouses or whatever, we give them things but we don't give them time. And I hadn't actually meant to say this, but dads, you know, kids want your time. I mean, your money's fine and trinkets are fine, but they don't really count. What they want is your time. You know, Jesus always had time. I mean, he had no time. He was so busy. But he always had time. He had time for the multitudes. But he also had time for the individual. And he would give as much time as he needed to the lady at the well, to the widow of Nain, 
to Zacchaeus, the tax collector, the crook, to this person and that person, he gave of his time. The Bible says that we must redeem the time. Ephesians 5.16 says, redeeming the time because the days are what? Evil. Now the word redeem there means to buy up and it's very interesting. The word there uh, is, um, it, it means to actually to buy up for yourself. It's in the middle voice. It means buy up for yourself the time. It's saying that time is a bargain, so redeem the time. Buy it up for yourself. I heard a fellow preach a sermon once on this verse, and he called it Kmart Blue Light Special. <laughs> Does anyone go to Kmart? I don't know. I don't go to Kmart very much, but I remember back in the most probably 80s, they used to have this cart they would carry out with a flashing blue light. Do they still have that at Kmart? I don't know. But it used to be the Kmart Blue Light Special. And the fellow would come over the, uh, uh, the PA and say, ladies and gentlemen, for the next 10 minutes we have a special. We have 80% off socks or tea towels or, uh, yeah, frozen chickens. Or, uh, I didn't sell chickens at <laughs> Kmart. We have 80% off something, usually something that was useless. But anyway, something, we have 80% off polka dot bow ties. Rush down, 80% off, as long as that blue light's flashing. And it's course, you'd, you'd, you'd yet to get out of the way because there'd be a stampede of people going through and uh, trying to get to those tea towels at 80% off. Once that light went off, they went back to the normal price. We must redeem the time. When that blue light's going, we have a time. We can redeem the time that we have. Why? Because the days are evil. I want to say that in preparation, all those things, and I've really only got one point this morning and a couple of applications. But here's my one main point. This is what it is. God's timing is all important. God's timing is all important. We could give a lot of Bible examples here. Come over to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 17. We all know the story. 1 Samuel chapter 17. One of the most famous chapters in the Bible. And it's about a, a lad who was a shepherd and a giant named Goliath. In verse number 9, this is Goliath, okay? I call him a galoot. Goliath the galoot, and this is what he said. 1 Samuel 17, verse 9. If you be able to fight with me, talking to the, Philistine, uh, to the, the, the soldiers of Israel, if you be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we'll be your, we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall you be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Here's this big windbag, Goliath, saying, come on, bring it on. Give me someone to fight. Let's have a fight. If you win, we'll be your servants. If we win, you'll be our servants. I defy the armies of the God of Israel. And he'd say this over and over again. The children of Israel, the, the men were very scared. Here comes David. Goes to take some stuff to his brothers. Look at verse 23. And as he, that's David, talked with them, his brothers, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines. And he spake according to the same words, what words? Defying the army of Israel. And David heard them. And David heard them. And it just so happened, this is God's timing. Here's, here's David out there doing his thing with the sheep, looking after the sheep and knocking the bears on the head and so on. And, and here, here's the armies of Israel. David was, he, he was the, the eighth son. He wasn't allowed to be in the, in the army there. Just so happens he's the messenger boy bringing the cheese down. And it just so happens, here's the timing of God. Right on the moment that Goliath gets up and starts defying Israel. And David hears this. And his heart is stern. And he said, hang on. You know what this bloke's doing? He's defying the God of Israel. 
He's defying our God. Let me at him. And of course, his brother said, are you naughty boy? Off you go. And what are his famous words? He said, is there not a cause? Are you just sitting here listening? Isn't someone going to stand up and fight here? Now, what if David had been five minutes either side of that? He would have delivered the cheese and off he went. It just so happened that, that God's timing was perfectly, was perfect. David heard that and he said, someone needs to stand up here because there is a cause and the rest is history. Come over to the book of Esther. Esther, chapter 4. Esther, chapter 4. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, chapter 4. Now we know the story of Esther, how that Haman tricked the king and the children of Israel were scheduled to be slaughtered. And here comes this, uh, the, the ward of Mordecai, the great man Mordecai, this beautiful young lady Esther who was accepted by the king. And Mordecai, verse 13 of Esther chapter 4, Mordecai an, uh, com- commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. Esther, don't think you're going to get away with this. Now, of course, remember, the king didn't know that she was a Jew. But Mordecai said, now, don't you think that you are going to escape like everyone else? Your neck is on the line as well. Look at verse 14. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. Look at this. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? He said... If you don't speak up, if you don't do something now, <clears throat> someone else will come and save us. Don't worry about that. God will look after us, but you and your father's house will be destroyed. He said, Esther, now think. It's not a coincidence that you are the most beautiful young lady in the whole land. It's not a coincidence that you are now <clears throat> in the palace. It's not a coincidence that all this stuff has happened. Who knows that God has raised you up for such a time as this? And as they say, the rest of the story is history. God intervened through this wonderful lady, Esther. Haman got hung on his own gallows and the enemies of Israel were destroyed. Isn't it amazing when you see God's timing? We just think, oh, it's coincidence. No, it's not coincidence. God has his timing. Now, we don't often know what God is doing. And usually it's just as well we don't. We just, we just go by faith. We live by faith. We trust the promises of God and we leave the timing up to God. But God's timing is amazing. God's timing is amazing. I often say that if you want to be a soul winner, a witnesser, it's just, it's just getting in with God's timing and say, Lord, you arrange my day. You, you arrange where I go and, and send someone across my path so that the time is right. And when the consecrated believer and the the inquiring sinner, when they intersect, that's when a work of God can take place. God's timing is an amazing thing. Back in 1982, uh, that's February 1982, that's over 35 years ago, um, I started uh, along with a young lady named Robin Powell, and her sister, Joy, we started going to a little Bible college in Borkham Hills in, uh, in Sydney. It was just a little Bible college. For some reason, God impressed upon the heart of Pastor Wenham, uh, rather Alan Roberts and Gerald Tidy, to start three, uh, several churches just to start this Bible, Bible college. And so we started going to college there. And then uh, the following year, um, David Mitchell he decided to come to college there. And so for the next few years, this college was open and I went to college there with, um, as I said, with Pastor Mitchell, with Glenn Matthews, with Alan Mitchell, uh, with um, Ross Oliver, with Peter Rame, with my brother Lyndon, all went to this college. And there's most probably others I can't think of. And then a few years later, the college closed down. 
You say, why did God allow that to happen? You know, all those fellows I mentioned, every one of them is still in full-time service today. Hmm. God knew that there was a bunch of young fellows there <clears throat> that needed some training. And so God says, I'm going to, uh, this is my timing here. I'm going to open up this college. We're going to give you some training. We're going to send you out into God's work. And I'm going to shut the thing down because it's not needed anymore. It's amazing how God works. In 1997, um, you know, it was August, August 97, 20 years ago this month, we moved to Brisbane. And we were only there a couple of years. I think we were there four years. And I was teaching at a Bible college in Brisbane. And, uh, you know, I was the vice principal of the college up there. That doesn't say much for the college, does it? <laughs> and um, <clears throat> were you in my college class? Did you take classes? You did, yeah. You didn't learn anything, though, did you? No, not a thing. <laughs> I wasn't much good at teaching welding. I really wasn't. But anyway, you know, I taught a fella. There were four men that, that I remember teaching. There were a few others. There was a fellow called Alex Holowati. Uh, there's a fellow called James Felipe. Uh, there's a fellow called Colin Faulkner. And there's another bloke called Chris Smith. And in varying degrees, I taught these men. I think I taught them Greek. Again, you're saying, you what? I did. I taught basic Greek. I don't think I did it well, but we taught basic Greek. Homiletics. And there were some other subjects I taught. And these fellows were way older than I am. And then just a few years after that, uh, we, we left at uh, December 19, uh, 2001. We were only there a few years. And we left, and just a few years later, the college closed down. You know those old fellas, not, not including Wayne Benneke, but these old, old fellas, every one of them is still on the mission field today. They are all very, very sick. <laughs> James Felipe's got cancer. Alex Holowati's uh, got cancer. Uh, Colin Faulkner has, uh, what do you call it? Uh, he's got... He's got Parkinson's disease. Um, Chris Smith has serious health issues. He's been in East Timor for the last almost 20 years. But all these men are still, they're, they're literally very, very sick, but they're still on the mission field today. See how God works things around? He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, for some strange reason to me, I'm going to put you here in, in uh, the heathens in Queensland. And I put you up there at a Bible college and you're going to teach these fellas and uh, I don't know if, know if we did a good job but you're going to try and influence these fellas. I remember with James Felipe, his English to this day is so bad. I said, James, we're going to pass you from Bible college. Not that you've done very good but we just want you on the mission field. <laughs> so we just start, stamped his exams, passed. Just go to the mission field, you know. They're still there today. And then God moves us on somewhere else. And we don't always understand the timing of the Lord. In fact, I think most of the time we don't understand it. But God is a God of timing. Right, here's some applications, and we'll be, we'll be, we'll be closed in just a few minutes. Here's a few applications. Number one, the right time is God's time. The right time is God's time. Psalm 27 verse 14 says this, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Someone once said that waiting time is not wasted time. We often think, oh, when we're waiting, we're wasting time. No, no, sometimes we need to wait. Sometimes we need to wait on the Lord. You know, Elijah needed some time in the desert. He needed time to sleep. He needed time to meet with God. He needed time to eat a little cake and drink from the brook and so on. Sometimes we need to wait. Because the worst thing is running ahead of God's time. I could give you some illustrations. We don't have the time this morning about people who run ahead of God's time and got into huge trouble. A lot of young people in church here this morning say, oh, I'll never get married. I'll guarantee these girls here thinking, I'm never going to get married. Yeah, yeah, just, just wait. The right fella will come along. Just, just be patient. Wait for the one that God has for you. Don't run ahead of God. <clears throat> so the right time is God's time. Secondly, <clears throat> it's high time 
to wake up. It's high time to wake up. Come back to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And if you're taking notes, write down this reference. Romans 13 verse 11. Romans 13 verse 11. And it said, this is what that verse says. It says, And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Knowing the time, it's now high time to awake out of sleep. The apostle there is talking to believers. He said, and he was saying this, listen, you know the time. Some of you are asleep spiritually. Now it's time to wake up because the Lord's coming back. Hey, that's pretty good advice for us today. If you're a sleeping Christian this morning, I don't mean someone that sleeps through the sermon, that's fine. But you know what I'm saying? If you are, and I often use this term, you are, you've been anesthetized by the world. It's now time to wake up because the Lord's coming back. That verse in 1 Peter chapter 4, we read it before. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 2. I want you to notice two more words here. It says that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. What was Peter saying to some Christians here? He was saying, listen, some of you believers, you are living your life after the flesh. He said, no longer. It's now time to stop living after the lusts of the flesh but live according to the will of God for your life. Folks, we've got to stop wasting time. Jesus is coming back. I don't know when. I guess it's going to be soon. But I can't say that with a surety. But some Christians are asleep spiritually. <clears throat> They're under this anesthetic. And the apostle says, hey, now is the time. It's high Time to wake up and get serious for God. So if your life is not serious for the Lord, maybe it, it, it once was. Maybe you were on fire for God at one stage. Now is the time to say, all right, I've had my nap. I now need to get up. I need to wake from my slumber and follow the will of God for my life. I think the time, it's high time that Australia is now at the crossroads. I really think that. In fact, I got a message from a, a friend in America, pastor, a dear pastor friend in America the other day, and this is what he said, and it's not original, but he said, you're looking at what, look at what's happening in the world today, and he said, one of three things is going to happen soon. Either Jesus is going to come back, or there's going to be great persecution come upon believers and it already is in a lot, of, a lot of the world. Christians are being slaughtered around the world today for the name of Christ. Or there's going to be a revival. <laughs> They're the only three options we have as this world changes. At a, it is changing weekly. The pace towards the coming of the Lord, towards the one world system and all this stuff. It's just gathering pace all the time. Either Jesus is going to come back, we're going to start getting persecuted as Christians, like many already are, or there's going to be a revival somewhere. We've got this thing coming up next month, this vote. I mean, even 10 years ago, you would have thought that would have been impossible, that Australia can get so far from God and his word. You know what the average Australian thinks? This is what the average Aussie thinks. I couldn't care less. Give me another beer. That's what the average Aussie thinks. That's the big majority in the middle. They just couldn't care less. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course, there's the <clears throat> spirit of Antichrist on one side saying we hate Jesus and we hate God and we hate the followers of Jesus Christ and we hate his word and we hate his church. We've got to expect that. But unfortunately, there's a lot of Christians on out here that are asleep, thinking, ah, oh, well, whatever. The one thing we can do is pray. We can pray. Get on our faces before God and say, God, the best thing we can do is pray. 
Maybe God has put us here in this church. With the, we have the truth of God's word. Maybe God has put us here for such a time as this. For such a time as this. <clears throat> you think God's worried about what's going on? God's not worried. <laughs> God's not worried. God knows what's going on. He's in, he's in control. We understand that. I think we need to pray for revival. I think we need to pray that God will intervene in our nation. <clears throat> it's high time to wake up and get serious. Lastly, my last application this morning is this. <clears throat> now is the time to receive Christ. Now is the time to receive Christ. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2 says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. D.L. Moody was conducting his, one of his big uh, evangelistic campaigns in Chicago. And he, he was speaking to thousands of people and he related the story how he gave the gospel message and he said, Listen, I want you to, to, to go home tonight and think about what I've spoken on about the fact that you're a sinner and that Jesus died for you and rose again and that you need to be saved. He said, I want you to go home and think about it. And he said, he sent the people home. That night, the great Chicago fire broke out. And people that were in the congregation at that meeting perished in that fire. And he said, never again would I tell people to go home and think about it. He said, from then on, I will tell them, no, you need to be saved today. Because now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. And one of the great lies of the devil, I believe, is that word tomorrow. Manana. Do it tomorrow. Oh, yeah, be, become a Christian. Have Christ in your life. Receive Christ. Yeah, that's good. That's a wonderful thing. Just don't do it now. And maybe there's someone here this morning. I guarantee there's someone here this morning. You might be a, a, a kid. You might be a teenager. You might be an adult. You might be a mature age person. You may be a, a senior citizen. You've never, ever, ever bowed before the Lord Jesus Christ and said, yes, I am a sinner. And I believe you died for me rose again and I now want you in my life please would you come into my life be my saviour now is the day not tomorrow not next week now has God spoken to your heart this morning our time is short folks there's a, there's a limit on time God is not limited by time but we have a limit on time this world, the Bible says, even back in Bible times, the Bible says that the world is groaning under the weight of the curse. One day it's going to be set free from that curse. But up until that time, we are subject to God's timetable. Let's not be asleep. Let's get busy in God's Word. Let's